The Irish and France. Three centuries of military history. Paris. Elegant, bohemian, dazzling. Paris is at the heart of Europe and center of power. Few people know the story of the wild geese and the contribution the Irish have made to this great nation. Ireland has provided some of the world's toughest, bravest and most dedicated soldiers. For hundreds of years, Irish soldiers have sought their destiny abroad. Wherever they traveled, on whichever side of the battlefield they have stood, the tales of their exploits have never been forgotten. Their story begins in 1691, when Patrick Sarsfield's army is defeated at the decisive Battle of the Boyne. From this point on, his attempts to oust the English and place James II on the throne were doomed. Sarsfield had to decide what to do next. And although his heart wanted to fight on, his head knew he had run out of options. He negotiated a treaty with the Williamites while his soldiers still held their weapons. Eleven days later, the resulting Treaty of Limerick allowed Sarsfield and his men to march out of town with full military honours. In November and December of 1691, fleets of ships anchored at Limerick and Cork to take away the Irish to their new lives in France. They took the name the Wild Geese in the hope and belief that this would be a temporary strategic exile in Europe. This is the legendary moment that echoes throughout the centuries. The flight of the wild geese. It was a tragic beginning to an epic voyage. The English ignored the treaty. In the spring of 1692, the new Jacobite army brought together on French soil numbered 15,000. The Duke of Berwick, James' illegitimate son, commanded the first unit and Patrick Sarsfield commanded the second. With this force, Louis XIV planned to invade England and put James back on the throne. With the addition of 7,000 French troops and a train of artillery, the wild geese held high hopes. They waited for the transport ships to take them to England and strike a blow at the heart of the regime that had taken so much from them in Ireland. In preparation for the invasion of England, Louis decided the French should strike a preemptive blow against the English navy. But when news got through that the English had joined forces with the Dutch to form a fleet that outnumbered the French and Irish two to one, it was too late to stop the French ships and they sailed out to disaster. The navies pounded away at each other in full view of the hopeful Irish exiles standing on the Cotentin Peninsula at La Hague in Normandy. Overwhelmed by English and Dutch cannon fire, the French fleet was crippled. Having lost control of the channel, Louis called off the invasion. It was a bitter disappointment for the wild geese, who saw it as their only possible way back home to Ireland. Their dreams shattered. They had to accept the reality of the situation. The best the Irish could hope for was to make a career in the French army, and Sarsfield and his comrades took the opportunity. Sarsfield transferred to the French army, where he was given the rank of Maréchal de Camp, the French equivalent of a major general, but never again commanded a substantial force of Irishmen. Gerald O'Connor was one of the chosen Irish officers who followed Sarsfield in commanding French regiments and was with him when fighting for Louis XIV began in May 1693, when the French taking the offensive laid siege to Flemish towns still in Anglo-Dutch hands. O'Connor witnessed the attack as Sarsfield and the French made a desperate bid to break through the Anglo-Dutch lines. They were met by a storm of cannon fire. I was with Sarsfield in the time of these brave horsemen. They remained under fire of the breastwork for two hours, unable to strike a single blow, 
but steadily closing up their shattered ranks. The French pushed past their dead and dying comrades. Finally the Anglo-Dutch flank was turned and broken, but Sarsfield had been wounded in one of these final charges, and O'Connor rushed to his side. The noble form of the hero lay on a pallet, in a hut, remembered O'Connor. He feebly lifted up his nerveless hand, and gave me a letter which he had dictated. I am dying, he said, the most glorious of deaths. We have seen the backs of the tyrants of our race. May you, Gerald, live to behold other such days. But let Ireland be always uppermost in your thoughts. He died two days later. His last words were, Oh, that this were for Ireland. For the Irish soldiers, it never was. It was every cause but their own. O'Connor continued to serve under the banner of Louis XIV, biding his time until he could face the enemy again. In the meantime, he would have five children, and two of them would eventually fight for the French king too. The spirit of Patrick Sarsfield and the wild geese continued over the centuries. In every part of the world, in every major conflict, the Irish have demonstrated their loyalty to their adopted homeland. The successes continued in their descendants, who went on to achieve so much in France and around the world. In France they often attained the highest ranks, integrating fully into French society. Today their names are emblazoned on the monuments and boulevards of Paris. During the 20th century, tens of thousands of Irish volunteered to fight in the British Army in the face of public condemnation from the Republican leadership. Side by side with the British, they faced slaughter at the Somme and desperation in the Second World War. Many also fought and lost their lives in the French resistance. Those that chose not to fight nevertheless volunteered in the front lines as medics. For the Irish, it was their ability to see the nobility in a great cause, to follow their dream, freedom for all. Together, American Irish, British Irish, and Irish from the Republic of Ireland continue to fight for freedom around the world, wherever you are in the world. If you are of Irish descent, you are part of this story and entitled to call yourself Wild Geese.